Welcome back to another episode of the Girl Stop Playing Podcast. It's your favorite homegirl, Coriel, here to encourage you to stop playing with your potential and start working for what you want in life and in love. You already know that I believe you can make the money and get the honey. You can have it all as long as you are willing to work. And it's my goal to bring you the information and the conversations to help you do just that. Now, before I introduce you to today's guest, please make sure that you are subscribe to this channel, like this video, and get ready to comment below and let us know something that you are taking away from today's conversation. Now, you you know that we are in for a treat whenever we have the opportunity to have a happily, healthily, I don't know if that's a word, but this is a happily, <laughs> healthily married couple that we got in the building. We have Mr. and Mrs. I know that your last name is James, but when I looked at you to say that, I'm like, you know what? I know that your first name is not actually Maddie. Maddie is short for your first name. No, no Maddie man. is the name. But is it, so that's the that's the story. So the story okay, is that yeah. in this introduction. Go ahead. So the thing is, I think Maddie obviously is like a nickname for so many people, and it's, it's spelled with an I E. So uh -huh. a lot of people think it's a, a short name. My dad's name is Matthew, so obviously Shut they call me Matt. But back in '84, when I was born, they weren't sure if I was going to be a boy or, the, or girl, so they were going to name me Matt. But then I came out a girl, so hey, then they came Maddie. up with Maddie. Yeah. Can I explain myself? <laughs> Okay, now Maya. I was okay, to say, now, now girl, Maya this story is, is wrong. Okay. Maya, my sister okay. is different. I was like, yes. now, if I got yes. this wrong, she's really gonna kill me. Okay, okay. We all just learned something. Okay, so we have the Jameses yes. in the building. <laughs> Maddie and Chris are here. Y'all welcome. Hey, Coach. Hey, how you doing? Us. I'm excited to talk to y'all. <laughs> it's always a treat when I can have a couple in the building because, you know, it'd be pulling teeth to get these men down to the studio. But Chris yeah. is in the building. Look at this. Chris, face. look at it. <laughs> pulling teeth. Why, why are the husbands? We were the so husbands? excited to see you. I am glad. We saw you guys. I Look, and the men, I'm like, y'all men need to get like a support group or something. A husband, oh. father, a uh, manly man. They need to like have like more like guy strips and stuff. Like they really yes. do. Cause we're, they we're just working do. on it. Yes. Yeah, me and, and the men involved. behind the scene, we're, we're yeah. working on it. Yeah, it's He's the thing. like part of the men's group at his church, which is so great. Cause it's like all of them are like in the same walk of life. Yes. You know what I mean? Cause like even our pastor's a millennial with small kids. So yes. like yes. all of them can relate to each other. And that's the thing as we like go through these life transitions and, and like, you mentioned mm -hmm. we saw y'all i was lit i had a baby like a week prior no, mm -hmm. literally you were literally, outside girl i could not wait to get outside okay you know i was like in jail like in a jail cell crossing off on the calendar i had crossed off that last uh day okay and i was ready to get outside but seeing other people probably like the look on our face was just like somebody who understands <laughs> yeah what is happening anytime i see a mom it's just like this is real ghetto. Anytime we're together and we see a couple, we're like, man, how are y'all doing it? And I think it was one of those moments, like, y'all have three kids. Yeah. What is happening? Yeah. So let's start there. Yeah. Y'all have three children. We do. Yeah. How? Tell the people how old your children are and then just, like, how is life lifing? So we have three kids, two girls and a boy, Mesa, Kaliana, and Christian. Mesa is eight, Kaliana is five, and Christian is three. That's kind of wild yeah. because I've like seen them grow up like yeah they pretty much have yeah. grown up online so, seriously because yeah. you were you were you when yeah. you had your first child so the people who yeah. are like uh, true to this and not new to yes, this we've know. literally seen yes. you become a mother yeah. and you say eight and I'm like oh my god am I how old am I yeah if I've no seen people you. like are upset especially because Christian our son who is our youngest he was a pandemic baby. He was born on the first day of 2020. He was born New Year's Day. So wow. him and my father-in-law actually have the same birthday. Wow. So it's just funny. So people will see him. They're like, no, this is not the baby because he's three. And I was like, no. He's he's grown now. He's yeah. Grown now. So Chris, was it important to you to try for a son? Or were you cool with two girls? No, I was actually good with two girls. Um, our birth story actually is, you know, we have three kids and we have two angel babies. Yeah. So Aww. by the time Christian came around, Christian was our fifth, fifth pregnancy. pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. with all of the things that we did to get the two here, I was like, you know, Whatever you don't have get, to do we, this. Yes, yes. If yes, you don't want to, yes, you know? Yes, yes. You don't have to. And, and because I grew up with like, in like a predominantly male environment, I was like, 
we cool. Like, we not that cool. Like, yeah. you know, it's just a boy. Yeah. You know, so I was, <laughs> no, really we had a bunch of them. Gotcha. We had a bunch of nephews. I was gotcha. like, you can, but Maddie had the, the complete opposite experience. Like, all her mom, her mom has five, five other sisters. sisters. It's me and Maya, you know, yeah. it's just the two of us. So I've never had a brother. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of my cousins are girls as well. So I just, I wanted that energy. And then, especially because I, he's right. He did grow up in a predominantly male environment. And I love my brothers in law like they're so wonderful and they have sons and i love my nephews and Mm -hmm. i was like i would love to have this experience because i've had such a positive one so far you know you know marrying into chris's family so i was like you know what let's try for it you know chris is right we've had every single birth experience we had the c-section i've done the natural no medication Uh management whatsoever and then i've had anesthesia i didn't get an epidural but we've had all of those and you know that is really taxing like labor is hard but i just I really like being a mom. I really do. Okay, we're gonna unpack that statement, and we're gonna we're gonna get back to that. But I want to kind of circle back around to the birth experience. Sure. I was not aware. You girl be trying to do a little bit of research, but I was not aware of this. <laughs> How did that affect your relationship? I think. And are y'all okay with talking about it? For sure. Okay. Yeah, the reason I really want to kind of go back into that a little bit is because these are those topics that people experience. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a tough. No matter how you think you're prepared you can't prepare for that you can have the best partner in the world and it still be very painful and when you're the one going through it if you haven't heard someone else's experience you're beating yourself up you're thinking that you did something wrong you something must be wrong with you know so uh, so what was your experience like and then if you are at a point where you could possibly either of you offer advice to someone who may go through something similar how do they get through it yeah i mean we both have two very different but necessary perspectives, you know, because, you know, I was the only one going through it uh, physically, but, you know, emotionally, that is so impactful to a couple. And I think what it was for me was, I, honestly, I think our first miscarriage, which we had before we had Mazo, was really what gut punched us as a, as a couple, as a unit. That was really, really hard. How far before Mazo? Was that three Two years? Two and a half years or so. Okay. Yeah. And it was in 2011. Tough. We got married in 2009. First yeah. miscarriage was in 2011. Yeah. We had her in 2014. Yeah. And it was just it was just hard. It was physically the hardest thing I had ever done. It was just it was really really hard. And of course you 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 are you know the concept of a miscarriage. You don't ever expect that it'll be you. It's very it's actually very common, which we learned later on. But you just don't expect it. Um, one of my favorite things about my husband is how. Um, honestly, how anointed he is, how he just gets the word immediately, his relationship with God, it's definitely helped me grow in my faith. But it was the first time I had ever seen Chris question God. That is mm. how much it rocked us. And it was just tough. And then we didn't talk about it. We weren't in therapy at the time. We didn't talk about it. So it was that thing we swept under the rug mm-hmm. and then we started tripping over the rug. Mm. You know. And so we, we did get to a point where we did end up getting pregnant, had a healthy pregnancy. Um, the labor was pretty traumatic. Um, I ended up having an emergency C-section, lost a lot of blood to the point where they wanted to give me a transfusion. I was like, baby, it's between me and God, so no thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was, that was a lot. And then probably about a year and a half later, we got separated. And a lot of that was deeply rooted in not unpacking. The unhealed. Yeah, we were depressed for literally like, what, four years? So we spent the good five years in like a active... Um, an active depression. Yeah, you know, like it was one of those. What does that look like things. from your perspective, Chris? Like personally, and then your perception of what Maddie was going through. It just looked like work. And I realized that my coping mechanism was working more. Like I always thought I could just like work my way out of things, right? Mm. Um, physical labor, mm-hmm. right? And I'm always, I've always been like a fairly introspective person, but. You know, what I learned on the back end is that I had to do more of the mental and emotional and spiritual work because, like Maddie said, I, I, I really did. I started questioning faith. And even to the point where I, I lost faith, right, mm-hmm. where it, it just didn't seem like it served me. And, you know, eventually you realize that that's not you that has that idea. But, you know, that idea comes from an enemy that's trying to get you further away from where you're supposed to be. Um, but yeah, like Maddie spoke to the first one, it was, uh, 
it was just one of those things where you, you know, looking back on it, you're young, you don't know. You, it's a trial that you have to go through where it's just like, you know, I did everything right. Right? <laughs> why yeah, me? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. why me, right? Exactly. Like, I'm the person that, like, I love you, tried though. Try to color God. inside yeah, the lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, try to color inside the lines, try to do the honor and the parents thing, you know, yeah. take care of my responsibilities at home and in the world, you know, approach the world as a responsible citizen. And, and it was just like, man, why me? Mm -hmm. Right? And, and so you realize once you enter into this club, you know, of, of miscarriages and the Angel Baby Club, that it's a pretty big club. Huge club. But it's one of those things that we don't talk about until you till you get there. You and get then there. you notice that, you know, when you come across people, it's it's just it's the silent it's acknowledgement. Yeah. It's the, oh yeah, I've been there. And one of the things that really helped me get through it is that uh once we started to seek counsel on it, my 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 spiritual counselor, my pastor, he he had gone through it too. Mm. And the key takeaway when we went to individual counseling and marriage counseling and couples counseling while we were trying to, you know, get our stuff together was we didn't know that you were supposed to allow for the grieving process, mm -hmm. right? When you go through, when you go through it um, medically, you know, there, the, the, the medical profession has such like a, a jaded approach to it. It's like, yeah, this happens all the like time. A, you yeah, know, like this, an in and out, yeah, a procedure, yeah, totally not a person. Out, right? It's totally that, yeah. And and it's not something that they they really consider that you have to like you have to labor with mm -hmm. that entire process. They're just like, you know, physically you're okay. Try again. Mm -hmm. That's that's pretty much what they told but us. But emotionally, you have to go through a process, you know? right? And it, and it's not just you who's going physically through it. It's your partner as that's well. The part. And that was really, I mean, that was a big revelation, I think, for me in 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 counseling for us in, in therapy. So had y'all gone to therapy, um have you gone had you gone to therapy like premarital or pre any of this or or post? Was that like your first time going down going we into done premarital, but since once we got married, we had never done therapy until gotcha. we got separated. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. what was immediately prior to the separation? What was like the final straw? I, I just think everything. I think everything just came together. It'd be like, you know, arguments. It would be, you know, focusing on work instead of each other. It would just it would just be like it just was we were literally not ourselves. We were just like yeah. it was like we had masks on. <laughs> we were like not we ourselves. Just got, we got caught up like we got we got too. Um, deep into our coping mechanisms, mm -hmm. right? And because of our personality types, what ended up happening is because I lean introvert, I just got within myself, mm -hmm. right? And then Maddie is an extrovert, a, yeah, like textbook, <laughs> textbook extrovert. So I was just, I was just so doing just, so much, yeah, I was just out, all over the place, traveling, moving, doing work, trying to just like just. But you had had you had one child already, yeah, maybe okay. was about and so. Yeah, she, when we when we, uh, when we when we got separated. we got separated, she was about two. So I, you know, trapped myself. I lost myself in like the work of just like being a dad and securing this one, mm -hmm. right? Because I had felt when we had the first one, it was like we had the first miscarriage. I could not. Um, there is an insecurity that comes in like knowing as a man I couldn't do anything about this, right? Like I couldn't protect my wife from this. I couldn't protect the baby from this. I'm supposed to be doing this, right? And so by the time Mesa came, I didn't realize I was kind of like overdoing it mm. in the dad department. Like overcompensating. Yeah. 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 And then with, with Maddie, because she was just like so like out in in the world, because from what we, 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 um, what we uncovered during therapy is that even though we had the second baby, the pain of the first like not being able to get it done was still it was a lot for her mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and both i and Mesa reminded her of that yeah. mm -hmm. and so because i couldn't get through on that end you focus your attention focus there and we just stopped talking and mm -hmm. i mean we you know really everybody know the key to the relationship is just like communicate communicate yep. communicate yep but i felt so like y'all like walking through the house like i'm passing you on the stairs and i'm not speaking no, not really. It was just more. But y'all so weren't having deep conversations. Yeah, nothing was deep. Was, it was just was like no depth. Yeah. All right, do what you got to do. I see you when I see yeah. you. And then it was just you know a big argument. 
one day and it was just like I would, it was just like one of us has to leave. I I'm the extrovert, so I was already moving a lot. I was like, okay, I'm gonna leave. Um, we were separated probably for about four months. Girl, where did you go, girl? I went and I got an apartment and I got nowhere yeah. really. Nowhere. I when I say I was literally down the street. Nowhere really. Honestly, I was like, this this and isn't was, gonna yeah, work if you like if you're always here. If you don't leave, yeah. If you're gonna leave, that was, that was low key kind of hilarious. It was like we're not even good at being separated. If it's like if you're here every day, then why are we paying we, a rent? Yeah, you know, somewhere and. You know, thank God for our village. I mean, um, and I talk about this all the time. It makes me emotional. But it was like the way my mother-in-law showed up for me during our separation, you would have thought she was my mother. And, you know, we're really fortunate because um, I, I talk about this all the time. You know, Chris is the only person I've dated whose parents were together. Any boyfriend that I've ever had, his parents were divorced or mm -hmm, they were mm -hmm. never married right. and they weren't together. And both sets of our parents are, you know, they're married and coincidentally married the same year. So this year, our parents will be married 43 years? 43 years. 43 wow. years. Okay. So my parents this month and I think his parents in August. And so, and, and they're certainly not perfect. I don't say that, but I, to have an example of what it looks like to work through to fight your, through and yeah, to not to just throw in the towel. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, it was it's really important. And so then, when my mom or my mother in law advised me, I could take them a look. You know, seriously, it's like you've done this. Yeah. You've been through some yeah. things. You're not just talking to me about what you heard about, what yes. you saw on TV, mm -hmm. what you yes. think I should do. Yes. That's based on literally exactly. nothing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And there was also, and I, I, I do say this, and you know, I, I have such a wonderful relationship with my mom. Both of the moms are prayer warriors, thank God. But there was such a level of no judgment from my mother-in-law that literally saved my life. I talk about that all the time. It literally saved my life. Because when somebody's going through something, they they probably already have a level of internal guilt and shame. They're already beating themselves yeah, up about so it. That like any ounce of judgment would have probably broken me down. And so, yeah, we, we did immediately get into, you know, cause Chris is about the work. So even though we couldn't stand each other, he found me, uh, you know, my therapist who ended up being our couples therapist as well. Um, and it was, it was literally prayer and therapy that we got back together. So what were, I mean, obviously you all have this child, so I'm sure. So nobody is like, well, girl, just leave. Yeah. What were, what were the messages though? Because because so often there is, we're not talking about it or it's not the right, we're not saying the right things. But I think those those examples come from women who have not gone through these right. things. Mm -hmm. so they don't necessarily see the need in you fighting for what you have. They don't see the value in keeping this family together. They right. want to cheer you on your own direction. Um, and that could have led you, you know, in two separate directions. For so sure. what was the conversation like with your moms yeah. during that time? You know, I think the thing that was really huge, and I and you, you see the opposite so many times, you know, on social media, but the, the number one piece of advice from both my mom and my mother-in-law is that part of why you fight for your marriage is for your children. We have made marriage so self-absorbed, and it's like your marriage doesn't just affect you. My marriage affects my children. It, it definitely affects your spouse. It affects your children. It affects the family that you've made, right? Like, I don't. I no longer just have my as a sibling, right? I now have two brothers and another sister, and actually more because each of his brothers are married. So they're my sisters as well. Mm -hmm. I have nieces and nephews because of their commitment in their marriages. And so this is a ripple effect on various people, right? For me, too, personally, I... The thing I love about us is that we were both willing to do the work more than we were willing to let go of it. Or win the fight or be yeah, right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like we were so, I, you know, even if it was just an ounce, we were more willing to do the work than be right, you know? And I always say that. I think one of the most important lessons I have learned in my 30s, I just turned 39, so I'm like, in my last year of my 30s, what have I learned that has been so profound and is that I am more I'm more focused on being ready to work than being right. Like mm. being right is so useless. 
It is. It's so useless. After the, the 30 seconds of you feeling so proud that you're right, then, what, then yeah. what do you have? For yeah. What, yeah. You know? yeah. And for me, this was something that was fixable. I mm. understand that there are some people who are in situations that are not fixable. This was fixable. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, was I going to let my pride prevent me from doing work to fix my marriage, which would have fractured how my daughter would have now seen relationships? That part. And, that, you know, because that is the number one place. That's the first place you learn about relationships yep. and is it worth it and so yeah. i always bring up <clears throat> the godfather kevin samuels don't don't close out don't log off listen stay with, <laughs> stay with me okay chris for you i have to ask really quick What's kevin that? samuels yes or no how how did you feel i'm neutral neutral okay. but i'm just like that on all things okay, right you okay. know i can i can see all sides of it but i'm, I'm neutral you could take the good you could leave the bad you could see i feel like he had in some instances he had um Solid messages. Mm -hmm. His tone and delivery was off a lot of times. A lot of times. You know, like if you're really out here trying to help people, you can't be like the helper and the shock chuck at the same time. Yeah. And he, and that's that's his, that so was I think his he issue. Was, you know, trying to help people in an entertaining way. It wasn't exactly. always the same. Yeah. Yeah. Like, sometimes, sometimes, it yeah. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes it was just me. Yeah. Sometimes it was just me. The problem was if the the the, the entertainment is discouragement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's where. You That's know. where that is where the people have the problem. Yeah. However, the reason I brought him up is because what you just said when you said like this, it's kind of opposite of what we hear on social media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Social media will have you out here broke, baby, without a job, without a man, like, yep. girl with nothing, with nothing, with nothing, just to be right, just to be on social just media, to baby, pie, just to be right, just to post, just for Twitter to agree with you for six hours. Get out of here with that, okay? But Kevin Samuels was saying a lot of the opposite of what is of, of what's popular on social media and uh -huh. one of his messages like common messages that i heard so many times is he would call women out on being home wreckers mm -hmm. in the sense of having so much pride that they literally wreck their home mm -hmm. that they're you know they're saying there's no good men they're mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. they're making mm -hmm. all of these complaints but they're so willing to walk away mm -hmm. they're so willing to mm -hmm. want to be right so bad that they're not willing to yeah. do the work yeah. they're so willing to say i'll figure this out on myself i can be good all by myself yeah. and not think about mm -hmm. You know, not think beyond themselves, not yeah. think about their children, not yeah. think about the extended family, not yeah. think about all all that you've built yeah. that would literally just be crumbling down if you decide I'm going to selfishly walk away. Now, as you said, there's obviously some extenuating circumstances Absolutely. that, you know, if this is going on and if it's best for you to remove yeah, yourself, then do the that. this is the context of my situation. Right, 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 sure. right, right, so, right. You know, this isn't to shame anybody. No, of course by, not. By any means. But yeah, I, it, it just wasn't worth it when I started adding two and two together. I was like... Girl, even think about that rent you was down there paying. It's yeah. like, the math is not mathing. Me paying my own bills... Let me be yeah, clear. Where, where that? Where's that? I need to come on back. Chris, I need to come on back. Was not yeah. interested at all. At all. And the the other blessing is is that Chris really is my friend. Because even through that, like I would be like on the phone with him, like this rent is what like I, not I think down that here. was the impetus of everything, man. It was like when it happened, right? When the the separation happened, I already went into it like I'm just not gonna leave you out there. Yeah. Right, I understand so that. Like this ain't working. Yeah, it was like this ain't like, this ain't. Gonna, I'm not gonna leave you. Maddie, you, you are ridiculous. No, ridiculous. Maddie was Please Maddie's wild. Help me in this apartment. I Baby. got to leave and, you. And the thing is, it's like, girl, you, what you do is wife. Like you're not good at this. You're yeah. not good at this. So, and what he does is husband. So we were out here. We didn't even know how to be separated, chat. Yeah? So y'all were. Like, Just fix this. I mean, I think that's the beauty, though, is that so, if your foundation is friendship, a lot of times you're eventually gonna like tell a joke, or you're eventually. Oh, yeah actually gonna like yeah. break the side it's not gonna be that was so... that was our issue too early though right what do you like, mean because i am the the point of levity and i know like it might not seem that way here but like yeah. it was a little too early like while maddie was still trying to argue things i was like this ain't us like we don't do this like even in like normal situations we don't like i don't yell at you you don't yell at me so i throw in a joke and she'd be like i don't want to hear jokes yeah, right now we're, we're supposed to be funny. upset at each other. I was like, yeah. you can be I'm upset mad. if you he want. He was but... like laughing at me. He was like, this was is like, not going to last. Silly. Like, he's like, this is not what we do. Yeah. yeah. And what was funny is very opposite of what happened after our first miscarriage during our separation. He had so much faith. He had so much joy. Or at least if if you didn't, you surely put on a good front. No, nah, I, I, I did. Because like I said, I was so I fell so deep into that hole of darkness that once we hit rock bottom and we separated it, it it came to a point where i had to look at myself and be like you're either gonna be here or if you want this daughter that you've poured so much energy into mm -hmm. 
to like get the best out of the situation regardless of what happened you gotta snap it together yeah so did that's she why stay I with you or did she go with maddie she was with me yeah. okay so okay. i had to lean heavily into um it was she stayed with me but i will say it was literally us being me my daughter my family and maddie's family all like we gonna work this out we standing in the gap because maddie's grandmother was uh watching our daughter while i was at mm, work okay and so we was all like we just gonna stand so in the gap for maddie in the meantime yeah yeah but we gotta like you know we we we, we gonna figure it out yeah so were y'all yeah. still like going to family functions together no nah, no be, okay i was trying i was trying my best a yeah. Little bit. Okay, yeah okay okay i was trying my best to like keep that line of separation but like i said Why? maddie Why? just kept Why? showing up because I, I needed the space uh, okay. we, no, no, we, we, we i, I needed the space like space. I, I do think that separation physical really? space. I, was in, I was in bad shape i was in bad shape i'm not gonna lie like outside of just spiritually i had lost like 30 pounds yeah and I had, like, so you were stressed out. i developed like an ulcer i was like i i need to not so, be i need to not and he doesn't drink and himself. deal with this like so i could like focus on recovering <laughs> Before we can get back into that stuff. So, like, I, I didn't I need to say, face. as a woman whose love language is quality time, and I like to be, like, all up underneath on top of my man. That's the fact me. that y'all said yeah, the separation, y'all needed that, that is just, like... We were in a really bad place. Like, now, I, I am under him all the time. And quality time, you know, furthest we, thing. it's the furthest, furthest thing. Like, we took the love languages quiz, and it's the last thing. But I'm... We're together all the time because we run our company together now and all of that. But yeah, at that time it was needed. And I and I think what I learned from that is to me, one, I learned that both people have to be willing to do the work. One person cannot work on the relationship, you know? So that was, you know, one blessing. But then two, you have got to grieve. You know, when you go through mm -hmm. a miscarriage, you have got to grieve and you have got to let your partner grieve and you guys pull in the necessary recess, well, resources and tools, right? Like if you need a spiritual advisor, if you need to go to therapy, if you need to be under your family more, like if your parents don't live, you know, in the same state, go fly and be under them. Like you really need to be nurtured. You know, and give it space. To what yeah. do you mean? Because I remember when we were talking about tipping point and when we like, because we were operating mm -hmm. at whatever that base level was, but right. it was the second miscarriage. I was about yes. to say, it when did this happen? After okay. Maisa was born. Yeah, after Maisa was born. So we had the one before we had Maisa, then we had the one after. Yep. Second and that's miscarriage. What? what yeah. Okay. And that's what that is amplified. Actually, yeah, that is what amplified. So did you have any postpartum with Maisa? I did. Oh, mm, it was, I it did. was. So, I did. so you never dealt with the grief. Yeah, it was long period. because they, my recovery was so long because of not only having a C-section, but the loss of blood. Mm. So I had already deemed myself inadequate. And then that second miscarriage was just like, yeah, it just like confirmed it, right? Yeah. Which is not a truth at all. Um, only to have two kids later, mm -hmm, <laughs> you know, right. but yeah, I think it was, that was really, really hard. And I never dealt with that. I never dealt with so that. So even the second time, did you all try to deal with it the same way you did with the first? Yeah, we just, which was we like, just stayed busy. We were worse off. Yeah, we were already worse off. Because we never dealt with it the first yeah. time. You, now you have a kid. So a lot of your energy that you would have spent to even get over that is now being poured into a child. <sighs> so much yeah. to unpack here because... Another thing that we don't ever talk about is the impact that becoming parents has on your partnership, mm -hmm. even the best partnership. Mm -hmm. So you all were kind of already operating below where you, like your norm, yep. because you were dealing with the residuals of yep. this first miscarriage. Then you become parents, which is so tough. supposed to be a blessing, right? Yeah. This is the blessing. You have successfully yep. made it to the finish line, but yep. then that blessing comes with so much yep. too. Yep. So Sweet that's even a whole thing of like, I don't want to feel ungrateful. Right for right. this right. blessing right right but but, but i'm hurting you're human i'm hurting I'm right. hurting. It's and i don't know why yeah and that's that's what depression is right like i feel this weight and i do not understand and I can't why get it off. And i can't get it off yeah, i yeah. can't shake yeah. it i don't yeah. feel like myself so not only do i not feel like myself I don't feel like your wife. Yeah. Because I'm not even me. So I'm not even I'm me. not even me. How yeah. can I show up to be my, my wife? And I'm like, I'm I now I gotta be a mama. I'm yeah. breastfeeding. I'm like, Girl, don't, don't even yeah. don't yeah. even bring the boobs into the yes. situation because yes. you you're you are literally a, pregnancy is a prison. So to break out of prison 
and then nurse your child. Maybe to break yeah. out of prison only to be like, oh, these gay The shackles have. on my feet. So I, girl, it, <laughs> listen, it's a thing. It's a whole thing. And that's yeah. why anytime I can use this platform to have these conversations, it's like, this is real life. And you no, don't know until life. it is your life. <laughs> yeah. Like, you don't know until it's right. here. And you think that you're the only one who's gone through this. It's yeah, like, no, girl, this is what life. they've been doing. For yeah, ages. It's hard. Yeah. It's, it's, so hard. hard. it's hard. It's hard. so hard. So, yeah, that was the second the second miscarriage definitely, like, that's what really hit me, the, the ish hit the fan, I guess you could say. Because we didn't have it. After Mesa? 11 months. Okay. Yeah, like, right at the year. 11 mark. months. We got, yeah. we got pregnant at 11 months after Mesa. Yeah. Okay. Also, I might I add, this is then, I also got fired from my 9 to 5 and hit Girl, transitioned uh-huh. in. To full time blogging and creating full time between you know? Mesa and the second. Yeah, Mesa was twenty fourteen. Okay, yeah, yeah. so twenty fifteen. So the, actually, yeah. today actually the to the day is actually yeah. It is huh? what eight years ago. Wow, yeah, seven yeah seven years ago. So yeah, so was dealing with that. So like life change after life change after life, life change after life. I mean, literally, we had a lot of those. Like yeah. when when we first got married and yes. we didn't yeah. understand you know what that would do to us because you know we were young and in love yep. yeah. and ready to face the world but we yep. had a lot of like yeah serious life changes and like grief causing traumatic events and early Brian, on i'm like we just got good at marriage like two years ago you know <laughs> because you i mean it's so tough go- adulting just by yourself yeah it is and imagine having to like come home and see this person i mean y'all can imagine let me look at y'all imagine having to come home and see this person while you don't even know who you are yeah. every day. I yes. mean, that is, it's, just, it's inexplicable, which is why anytime I can talk to somebody who can relate, I'm like, yeah. y'all, how are y'all doing it? Yeah. What is going on? Yeah. So did you feel like once you shook off, like you got back together, you know, you're no longer separated. You have like a new lease on life. You yeah. all get pregnant again. Yeah. What was your experience like with Kaliana? Kaliana's pregnancy was literally miraculous in all the ways, you know, and... So the reason why I had such a really hard pregnancy with Mesa and why I had the lot the two miscarriages was because of fibroids. I had three very large fibroids. I've always been petite, but these fibroids were pretty massive. Did you know you had and fibroids? I did. Okay. I did. Once we had the first miscarriage, I think that's when I found it. was the out. first. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's first when we identified it. Yeah. So one day, I, I write about this in the book. Um, one day I go for, I think it was right when we hit third trimester with Callie. We go for the ultrasound or whatnot. And, you know, we see her. We hear her little heartbeats. So everything's cool. But then, the, like, the nurse is still looking. And I'm like, well, girl, is everything okay? Because we thought we the were silence, ready to go. The silence, girl. The silence. Yeah, so I'm like, yeah. So she's, like, really looking. So I'm like, I'm concerned, but I know everything's cool and stuff like that. So I'm like, what's wrong? She's like, this one fibroid that you have had the entire pregnancy is just no longer here. <laughs> she was like, I. she's like, I have been doing this for 18 years. She's like, I have never. She's like, it's not there. She's like, I'm triple checking. That's why we're still here. She's like, it is literally just not there. And I remember because we had been actively praying. Like I had even gone vegan after having uh, Mesa for, I think, like, I think maybe like three or four months to see if we could help shrink them or whatnot. And actually in each and every one of my pregnancies, I went through what they call fibroid degeneration, where the blood was actually cut off from each of my fibroids, Mm. which doesn't necessarily happen for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so that could also cause, yeah, to shrink. But one of them just completely disappeared in Kaliana's um, pregnancy. And never came back. Never came back. I didn't realize that fibroids was like ruining lives out here like it's this. Really, it's yes. really ruining lives. So out you here. you said you found out when you had the first miscarriage, but your whole entire life, when you got your annual exams, when you never first got pregnant, that. nobody no said hair, no nothing. That nobody is so has crazy. ever brought that up. And then when I started bringing it up to like my mom and stuff, like she's like, "Yeah, your aunt has this," and I'm like, "Why? Why we didn't talk about this oh, again? Yeah. Why is this a secret? <laughs> why is it a secret?" And even when we started doing having those conversations with doctors and they were yeah. just like oh yeah this is normal this is what yeah. black women this deal what with black women yeah. have and this is what you have to deal it's with and then so talking about op- the options behind it and it was just like yeah and, and all the options about? are always surgery yeah. it's like oh yeah you just, just cut, cut yourself out. over oh, yeah you can have a hysterectomy yeah, yeah. So yeah. i had nicole nicole garner scott yeah. here and we talked about her experience which she had she didn't have a miscarriage but she had a very hard time getting yeah, pregnant yeah. because of the fibroids had the surge you know just the experience of it she didn't know about it talked to her mom her mom's like yeah I have, you know like it's just yeah. the whole thing so literally last week i don't remember who it was but someone posted on um 
Instagram that they had a hysterectomy. They had to get, mm-hmm. you know, and the mm-hmm. number of women yeah. in the comments that were like, yeah, I had mine last month. Yeah, I got, I'm scheduled for two weeks. It's just like the fact yeah. that so many women are going through this yes. and they obviously don't have very many people in real life to connect with because yeah. they're right here yeah. on the internet yeah. Bonding Sharing. Yeah. Bonding yeah. with Bonding strangers together. over this traumatic thing that they're going through. I just, I didn't realize it was such a thing. Yeah, me neither until like, Again, I I was very open about it, you know, with my mom and my mother-in-law and stuff like that and just starting to talk about it. And we did thorough research about it because I was like, I do not want to go through what I went through with Mesa um, postpartum or anything like that. Um, I had even researched like placenta encapsulation. I was just like, because I was like, whatever it takes for my postpartum to be great. I think I had, I didn't have postpartum depression with Callie or Christian. I, I remember with Christian, that was like the most energy I had ever had. I was well, like, how did How did it show strange. up? How did your postpartum show up? Because I think that's the thing too. It's, and I say this all the time, I think people will be laughing at me, but I'm serious. When I, before I got pregnant, my thought of postpartum came from like an episode of ER when I was a yeah. little girl. It yeah. was like, if you, or Law and Order, like if you have postpartum, you want to hurt your child, you yeah. want to hurt yourself, yeah. and yeah. That, yeah. that's postpartum, that's mm-hmm. it. It is such a range, mm-hmm. and a lot. Most people, I'm, I'm willing to say, most people experience it in some, in some ways, but it shows up differently. Yeah. So, how did yeah. yours show up for you? I would just be like so spaced out, and just think about like ways I could either hurt myself or like physically change myself to like be adequate for Chris and and for Mesa. You know what I mean? I would just think about. It, would, it just was, it literally felt like a dark cloud over mm. me. And just like, it was just in my mind. I just had such dark thoughts about, you know, I didn't really have a lot about hurting Mesa because I was so fractured in my self-esteem and, you know, me as a person physically. Because I was like, okay, I, I couldn't carry this one baby. I barely could carry this one. They had to cut her, op- cut her out of me, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. So, Girl, yeah. that's a whole thing. That That is a whole thing. Beating yeah. yourself up around your birth. Yes experience yes. it's like if the experience is not bad enough what yeah, you what yeah. you do to yourself yes you know the inadequacy of it all yeah. the feeling like my body my thought was how come my body couldn't do what it needed right. to do right so that is a whole thing again like, if you're the only one who's ever gone through it in your mind yeah. then what's wrong with you exactly mm-hmm. would yeah. you say that you had any type of we don't ever talk about this with men like what was your i guess postpartum experience To be honest, it was it 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 was sadness, right? It was a sadness that again that came with the fact that like there's nothing I can do about it. Like mm-hmm. our emergency C section was heavy, and then later to find out that it was unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it that's was, what it was is. like. But the way in which it happened and like. There are some things that happened on the operating table that I was privy to while Maddie was knocked out between, like, the conversations that was had. Like, we weren't there. And, like, this ain't a human being. Outside of just being my wife, like, this is a human being. We just, like, so callously talking about whether or not we're going to let her be here, like, be here or not. Right? And then there were just some things that happened on the operating table where just so I just don't get like, It's just, yeah. like, it's very <laughs> visceral and, yeah, that... And then to watch her come through it or try to get through it, it, it it literally took us six months or so until she could, like, move around. Wow. Yeah. Right? And then that her, uh, her lull or her funk that she was in was about another year. And in that space and, and time, then, we got pregnant again. Yeah, no, we got pregnant again. Then we had, yeah, then we had um, the scare, And so. so I was just like, I was tired, one, because, yeah, you know, part. I'm heavy into the parenting of a newborn. And, and, and right? I'm, I'm newborn, then I'm at work, and then I check on my wife. Um, and then, two, you have, you know, the sadness was just that, like, man, there's really nothing I can do about it. There's nothing that I know about it. Like, I'm a heavy researcher on things, but in this situation, one, I just didn't know what to look for, right? Because, like, What's happening? we're not... We hadn't left the house yet to run into those people <laughs> yeah. to like be like, hey, man, I know what you're talking about, mm-hmm. you know, or, you know, to, to start there. So 
Yeah, yeah, that, that's what it was. I try, you know, try my best to be as upbeat as possible and um, provide space for Maddie to feel everything that she's gonna feel. And um, physically, I tried my best to, you know, soften the the burden of the load of whatever I could. But I can't breastfeed, so that part, yeah. especially in the Ooh, middle of the night, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're in the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like if you're already in a like a a physically depressed state, it's like. You need to sleep. Yeah. And in the middle of the night, you're not sleeping. Not sleeping. So I, there's nothing I can do about yeah. that except like hand the baby over and, and rub her your back. First baby, so, so you're trying to do everything perfectly. Like I'm like pumping in the middle of the night. I'm trying to make sure like everything. It was really, really hard, really hard. But yeah. But yeah, it was. It's really just I don't know. Just balancing that that weird dichotomy of like, man, this is really awesome because I have this baby here. And the love that surrounds that and the admiration that you have for your wife for going through it. And I'm happy and all that. There's the joy of that. But then there's the sadness of, like, the aftermath, yeah. you know? And the reality yeah. of it all. Yeah. It's, like, it's a lot. Yeah. It is a lot. And I cannot believe that y'all been parenting like this. Like, people just been having these kids doing all these things yeah. for years. Yeah. It's not for the weak. It's definitely not for the weak. Marriage is also week. not for the weak. It's just not. It's absolutely it's not. not. It's. I mean, when it's good, it's good, but it's not always good. Yeah. And so I love that you all can represent wholesome, and I'm going to say healthily, happily and healthily, <laughs> wholesome <laughs> marriage that's not just picture perfect. It's mm -hmm. like, yo, life be life in. Mm -hmm. We are navigating it as best we can. Absolutely. We're trying to maintain a friendship. We're trying to raise good people. Yes. And that's really what it comes down to. So Absolutely. as we conclude, I would love for each of you, Maddie for the women, Chris for the men, for the wives and for the husbands, to just share a word of advice that you've learned through marriage um, that you can share with someone who might be going through it right now. Do you have something? Anything off the top? This is the one thing I always say, you know, like husbands, husbands, where am I? Must my right camera here. right here? Okay. <laughs> um, husbands, try your best to learn to speak to your wife's heart. Because that's where her baseline of understanding comes from. It's how she feels about what you're saying. You may logically say all the right things. <laughs> you may fundamentally feel like you're doing all the right things. But if she doesn't feel it, you all won't feel it. So try your best to do the things and say the words that speak to her heart. That's good. Yeah. You know, I think the first thing that comes to mind is stop thinking and doing, right? Stop thinking and, and thinking that you need to be everything to everyone. Because that is literally costing you your peace. Mm. And that is literally not your purpose. Your purpose is not to be everything to everyone. That's God's purpose, and he has it on lock. You're supposed to do what you're supposed to do. And you sometimes have to stop and step back and reevaluate what really matters, right? Talk to your husband. What matters to you guys, right? Because, yes, what matters to you is important. So I definitely don't want to negate that. But if you're in a marriage, it's what's important to you guys, right? We don't need, respectfully, you don't need a bunch of third-party opinions, right? I'm the only person married to Chris. Chris is the only person married to me. I respect what my parents have to say. I respect what my therapist has to say. But at the end of the day, we are making decisions together as a couple. Mm -hmm. I don't care how social media thinks, what they think about my marriage. You know, if they think it's great, cool. If you don't, that's cool too. You know what I mean? I'm okay with not pleasing everyone around me as long as my husband is at peace with me and I'm at peace with him. So stop trying to be everything to everybody or trying to make your marriage seem like it's an example for others. That's not what your marriage is. It is not a tool. Mm. It is supposed to be your safe haven. And do whatever it takes for you and your spouse to feel safe with one another. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Cannot let you leave though, Maddie, without telling us about everyday magic. Yes. Please get everyday magic. The joy of not being everything and still being more than enough. It is my book available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, pretty much wherever books are sold, um, Target.com. And it really, I talk about, you know, our story in the book. And I really talk about how to navigate the work of every day because it's a lot for, you know, 
it's a lot for all of us, but of course, as a, as a wife and a mother, I speak from that perspective, how my faith has helped me. And just like, sometimes you forget because you got so much going on. So it's pretty much like a big reference book of like, hey, here are the appointments you need to make, you know, monthly, yearly, you know, uh, weekly. So practical information. Yeah. yeah, it's really a practical a approach to everyday life. So I hope you're encouraged when you read it. Check it out. I read it on Audible, but get the physical book too so you can highlight some stuff and reference it. I love it. I just love it y'all we gotta hang out yeah. in real life we do. with people who get do y'all have a lot of couple friends we do because we do. do they that, come from that's, church that's also the key though or no yeah. happy couple friends yeah yeah, yeah. we're learning that well, yeah the key is like in in marriage and in parenting you have to you gotta you gotta do life together man yeah you need peace you gotta find people at your same level yeah. you gotta do it together that doesn't mean to that everybody's that. privy to the inner workings of your marriage yeah but it is good to have, have that, that village. Group of people. You always reference that village. The village yeah. is literally key. Your birthday, that that was the village, <laughs> was baby. <laughs> I said she was not lying, baby. Look at this village. That is a village. I, about them all the time, and I was like, no, y'all, really, the village is really? not hypothetical. No, They're it's here. a real village. But to, <laughs> to your question, though, yes, they come from church, but they also come from life. We have some lifelong friends in there. We have some um, work people who are work associates that became friends so they come from everywhere yeah. it's just that I just collect good people yeah That's it's just it. that we we've we've made a you know we we've made it our goal to just like curate good relationships with people all around us and really for us we're like we want to at this point in our lives we want to have the people that are around us the people that we include in our village no matter where they come from they need to all be able to to co Inter this co yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, instead of having those the, pockets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like when we were Which teenagers, is why people were at my yeah, house. Yeah, for the they were. It was, it was beautiful. <laughs> that was beautiful. And I, I, I love that not just for you, but for your kids. Yeah. And I know y'all have a big family, but the extended yeah. village is yeah. just like the extended village. I love that really, for y'all. Yes. Invite us next time. All right, y'all. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. I'm gonna let y'all know if I get that invite. Okay. Check, check my stories. Thank y'all for tuning in for another bomb episode. Be sure to grab a copy of Maddie's book, Chris. I don't think. Chris got no Instagram. You find Chris on Maddie's page, okay? He'll be on there, okay? <laughs> That's where he'll be. That's where he'll be. I love y'all. Appreciate you love for being you. here. Thanks Thank for you for being us. an example. Thank you for being so transparent because I haven't even looked at my notes. We didn't talk about nothing no, that I thought we were going to talk about. Yeah. I Chris did it. That was he Chris. Did. Chris this took us Chris. down yeah. that detour and I appreciated it. Star. Yes. <laughs> He's like, I did. You did it. <laughs> Thank y'all for tuning in. See you on the next episode. If you enjoyed that episode, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any upcoming content and take it a step further and go ahead and join our private community over on Patreon because it comes with some pretty bomb perks, including early and discounted access to our upcoming events, behind the scene exclusives with some of your favorite guests, the opportunity to call in on an upcoming show, the chance to vote on topics and guests for brand new shows, and I'm even giving you unlimited access to my vault of business classes where I'm teaching you everything from Airbnb to developing digital products and everything in between. And you can get access to our Patreon for as little as $5 a month, okay? Get in where you fit in, and I'll see you on the inside. Peace.